Hello once again. This is your this is your teacher Jason, and today I'm going to discuss part two of our subject creative writing. So we're going to discuss the second part of the elements and structure of poetry. But before that, I would like to inform you that this subject or this lecture is prepared by Miss Luella S. Celab and edited by Ryan Paigna and Mr. Le Leo Wilfredo Gapas from the Division of Agusan del Norte. Once again, our learning competency is to identify the various elements techniques, and literary devices in specific form of poetry with our specific objectives. Number one, define the elements, structures, and literary devices of poetry. Number two, name various elements, structures, and literary device of poetry. And number three, to appreciate the beauty of poetry. Before we're going to proceed with our main lesson, I would like to review what we have discussed in the previous video. So in the previous video, we talked about the sound devices. And these are alliteration, assonance, consonance, onomatopoeia, rhyme or rhyme scheme, the rhythm or the rhythmic patterns, and poetic matter. We have also discussed the structure of poetry, such as stanza, and each stanza can be categorized according to the number of lines they possess. If a stanza has one line, it is called a monostich. If it has two lines, it, has, it is called a couplet. If it has three lines, it is called tercet. If it has four lines, it is called quatrain. If the stanza has five lines, it is called cinquain. Six lines, sestet or sexane. If it has seven lines, it is called septet. And if it has eight lines, it is called an octave. Okay, so those are the things that we have discussed in the previous video and today we're going to continue our lesson in the forms of poetry now in most cases a poem may not have a specific line or stanza and there are also poem that does not have a metrical pattern however it can still be labeled according to its form or style now, we will discuss the three most common types of poetry according to its form. The first form of poetry is what we call the lyric poetry. Lyric poetry is any poem with one speaker, not necessarily the poet, because it could be a third person or it could be someone else, who expresses a strong thoughts and feelings. So this is the main distinction of uh, a lyric poetry. It contains a very strong thoughts and emotion. Most poems, especially the modern ones, are lyric poetry. If you notice our modern poetry, nowadays, mostly they are derived from human emotion. And if a poem contains a very strong emotion, it can be labeled as a lyric poetry. Now, the next slide will show you some types of lyric poetry. So, the first type of a lyric poetry is what we call an ode. Okay? An ode is a lyric poem that praises an individual, an idea, or an event. So it exalts someone. It gives praises to someone. The length is usually moderate. The subject is serious. And the style is elevated, usually very formal. And the stanza pattern is elaborate. In ancient Greece, odes were originally accompanied by music. 
In fact, the word ode comes from the Greek word aden, which means to sing or to dance. An example of ode is the following. I'm going to read to you an ode to the West, Oust Ode to the West Wind by Percy Bashy Shelley. Uh -huh. Percy Shelley, I just called her Percy Shelley. He's, she's actually the author of the well known novel Frankenstein. Okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's Mary Shelley. <laughs> so, Percy Shelley is a different person. Okay. Anyway, going back, going back to Ode, um, scatter as from an extinguished heart, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind, be through my lips on to an awakened earth, the trumpet of a prophecy, O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? So, this is an example of an ode. It is written for someone in order to give praise, to exalt, or to elevate someone. Okay? To, uh, to distinguish that person from the rest by praising that person. Scatter as from the unextinguished heart's ashes and sparks. So, imagine that... The person has been um, compared to unextinguished hearts, ashes, and sparks. My words among mankind be through my lips to an awakened earth, the trumpet of prophecy. O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. Uh, see, that is a very metaphorical form of phrase praising someone now the next form of poetry is quite contrary to the first um uh, to the first lyrical poem it is called elegy now an elegy is opposite to ode in some manner because the purpose of elegy is not to give praise to someone but to mourn the dead. So usually we give elegy to the people we love. Okay, when we mourn okay, for someone um, who, who died already, usually we write an elegy. It usually begins by reminiscing about the dead person. Okay, by remembering his good deeds, then weeps for the reason of death. And then resolves the grief by concluding that leads to immortality. Okay? So the first one, the ode, the ode gives praise to someone who is still living. The second one, the second form of lyric poetry is written in order to mourn the dead. And in mourning the dead, when we, when we write an elegy, it usually starts starts by remembering the good deeds or the happy moments, the happy mom memories of the dead person. And then it is followed by lamenting, by mourning the cause of the death. And finally, it gives into, it leads into the resolution that death leads into immortality. It has no set of stanza or metrical pattern. It often uses apostrophe as a literary technique. If you remember apostrophe in our previous lesson, it is a literary device wherein you speak to someone who is not actually there, okay, a dead person or something that is not literally living as if they are in front of you and as if they are living. When you are talking to the dead as if you are talking to a living, you are using a literary device called apostrophe. And apostrophe is a very common literary device used in writing elegy. Okay. The next form of a lyric poetry 
Of course, that is elegy, and now we're going to give an example. The example that I'm going to read is entitled, Oh, Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman. Okay? It goes like this. Oh, Captain, my Captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag flung, for you the bogle trills, for you the bouquet, the bouquet and ribbon wreath. For you the shores crowding, for you they call the swaying mass, the eager faces turning. Hear, Captain, dear Captain, O oh, dear Father, this arm beneath your head. It is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. Okay, so that's an example of an elegy written by Walt Whitman entitled, O Captain, My Captain. So it is writ it's written by a son or a child to his dead father. Okay, and he refers to his father as his captain. Okay, he said, rise up, O hear the bells. It means that the one he's talking to is basically no longer living and he wants him to rise. To rise for you, the flag is flung. For you, the bugle, the bugle trills. For you, the bouquets and the ribbon ref. For you, the shores are crowding. So these are um, examples of how he commemorate um, his father during, during his time uh, in the earth as if he's a really important person for that child. He said, for you, they call the swaying mass. You see, how, how he writes something to compare, how, how he uses words in order to compare his father into someone who is very popular that everybody calls, and the mass was swaying, and their faces were eager in order to see him but there at the at the next line he said this arm beneath your head it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead see so that is an example of elegy and that is popularized by of course a popular writer named walt whitman The next form of a lyric poetry is a sonnet. Okay, let's, uh, let's review. First, we have ode. Second, we have elegy. And now we have a sonnet. Now, a sonnet is very popular. In fact, it has three versions. Now, it is a lyric poem consisting of 14 lines. So this is a common characteristic between sonnets. All sonnets are written in 14 lines. And in the English version, it is usually an iambic pentameter. Okay, when we say iambic pentameter, there are five iams in every line. Now, the three basic kinds of sonnets, as I said, as I said there are three versions of sonnets. The first one is the Italian or the Petrarchan sonnet. It is named after Petrarch, an Italian Renaissance poet. The Petrarchan sonnet consists of an octave. Okay, when you say octave, that it comes, it, uh, the stanza contains eight lines and a seste, six lines. So an octave and a seste. That makes it 14 lines. It tends to divide the thought into two parts, the argument and the conclusion. Now, the rhyming pattern for an Italian or the Petrarchan sonnet usually follows the rhyme scheme ABBA, EBBA, CDE, CDE, or some accepted sestet such as CDC, CDC, uh, or CDD, CDE, or CD. C D C D. Okay, so that's the um, basic uh, rhyme scheme for the Petrarchan sonnet. Now let's look into the example that I have prepared for you. This is um, entitled "When I Consider How My Light Is Spent" 
by John Milton. I'm going to read this to you. Okay? Ready. <laughs> when I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days is dark, world and wide, and the one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker, and present my true account, lest a returning chide doth God exact day labor, light denied? I fondly ask, but patience to prevent, that murmur soon replies, God that need either man's work or his own gifts, who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best, his state is kingly, thousand at his bidding speed, and post or land and ocean without rest, they also serve who only stand and wait. Okay, so that's the sonnet written by G John Milton, entitled, When I Consider How My Life Is Spent. If you notice, okay, if you notice the rhyme scheme, because we're going to review the rhyme scheme in that sonnet, the first sound, in the first, uh, the first line, the last sound that you can hear is spent. So t, okay, that is the sound t, and we label it with A. In the second line, the sound white, okay, the end sound is d. So since it has a different sound with the first one, which is t, we label it with b. The third line has a sound hide, which is rhyming to the word wide. So we label it b again because it has the same sound. The third line, bent. Bent is rhyming with spent, which is the first sound we have a while ago. So we'll label it with letter A. That means they have the same sound. The next line, present, it has t sound, which is rhyming with bent and spent. So we'll label it with the same letter, letter A. The next sound is chid. D, d, the sound is d, which is rhyming with hide and wide. So we label it with b, with a b. So it has the same sound. Denied, which is rhyming with chide and hide and wide. So still it is letter b. Then prevent, which is rhyming with bent and spent. So we label it with letter A. So if we consider that, we form a rhyme scheme A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, which is basically the same rhyme scheme that I told you a while ago when we described the Petrarchan sonnet. Okay. The next category or the next kind of sonnet is popularized by our very very popular William Shakespeare. It's called the Shakespearean sonnet. The Shakespearean sonnet consists of three quatrain or four lines each in every stanza and a concluding couplet of two lines again there are four uh there are three quatrains okay so each quatrain contain contains of course four lines so times three that's 12 plus the last stanza is composed of a couplet so that's make it 14 lines and it qualifies for the sonnet because remember a sonnet consists of 14 lines okay now, the Shakespearean sonnet um, is composed of, of course, a final couplet, is, is the summary of the sonnet, and the rhyming pattern is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, sorry, <laughs> E, F, E, F, and the last uh, couplet is G, G. Okay, so let's going to, let us take a look into the example if it follows the rhyme scheme that is being described here in our definition.
Okay, so this is an example of um, sonnet written by William Shakespeare. It's sonnet 18. Okay. But let me say if I can read it um, correctly, <laughs> but I'm going to read it anyway. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds thou shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves are all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often it is, is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes decline, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of what faith thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in a shade when in eternal line to time thou growest. So long as man can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry if I, there are some lines, because um, supposedly when you're going to uh, read a poem, you're not going to pause or to stop, not unless you uh, encounter a zizura. Now, a zizura is usually in a form of a comma or a punctuation, uh, a punctuation or a, a comma or any punctuation, comma or period or a colon or semicolon, okay? Usually those are some forms of cesura that gives you a signal to take a break. Not unless you find those cesura in the line, then you should read the line with an enjamen, okay? We call it an enjamen, wherein the next line continues to the second line without a pause, okay? So, that's just um, a trivia. <laughs> now, going back to the rhyme scheme, okay, let's take a look. The first line, okay, the word is day, okay? Day, so that's the first sound, so we we'll label it with letter A. So, it's always letter A. Do not start with letter B, okay? It's always letter A. Now, the second line is temperate. So it does not rhyme with day, so usually we give it the second letter, that's letter B. Third line, may, it rhymes with day, so we label it with letter A, meaning they have the same sound. Then the next line is date, which is rhyming with the word temperate, okay? And because of that, we label it with letter B. It means they have the same sound or they are rhyming. So in the first stanza, the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. Now let's go to the second stanza. Shines. Okay, that's a different sound. So we'll label it with letter C. Dimmed. That's another sound. We we'll la we'll label it with letter D. Declines. Okay, it uh, declines rhymes with shines. So we we'll label it with letter C, meaning they have the same sound. And trimmed, so it rhymes with dimmed. So we we'll label it with letter D, meaning they have the same sound. So for the second stanza, it's CD, CD. And in the third stanza, we have fade, that's letter E, because it's different. It's a different sound. Then we have oast. Another sound, so we label it with letter F. Shade, which is rhyming with fade, so letter E again. Then gross, which is rhyming with oast, so it's letter F again. So that's E F E F for the third stanza. And for the last stanza, which is a couplet, it ends with the same sound. So we label it with letter G. Okay, so there are two G okay, for the two uh, remaining lines. So the rhyme scheme of Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare is A B A B C D C D E F E F G G, and that is basically the same rhyme scheme or pattern that is being described in our definition. Hey, okay, thank you very much. I I hope that you 
understand that well. But anyways, if you have questions or there are clar clar some clarification that you want to ask, please feel free to comment your question in the comment section. Or you can directly PM me or give me a direct message on my Facebook account. Okay, the next form of sonnet or the next kind of sonnet is popularized by Edmund Spencer. So it's called a Spencerian sonnet. That's first, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a Spencerian sonnet is divided into three quatrain or segments of four lines followed by a rhyming couplet. Okay, it has the same pattern with a, an, a Shakespearean sonnet composed of three quatrain and one couplet. Okay, however, they are different in rhyme scheme. So they only differ in the rhyme scheme because the rhyme scheme of a Spencerian sonnet is ABAB, BCBC, CDCD, and EE. Okay, so uh, remember the the Shakespearean sonnet is A B A B C D C D E F E F then G G. Now in uh, Spencerian sonnet, it's A B A B B C B C C D C D and E E. Okay, so that's the only difference between Spencerian and Shakespearean sonnet. They only differ on the end rhyme scheme. Let's take a look with the example. Of course, there's an example. Uh, sonnet 30, entitled Fire and Ice by Edmund Spencer. Okay, I'm going to read the poem again. And I would like to apologize in advance if there are some minor errors in reading the poem. Let, it goes like this. My love is like to ice, and I to fire. How cometh then that he that this hath cold so great, great is not dissolved through my so hot desire, but harder grows the more I her entreat. Okay, let me read it again because I think I commit a mistake on the second line. <laughs> okay, again. My love is like to ice, and I to fire. How cometh then that these, her cold so great, is not dissolved through my so hot desire? But harder grows the more I her entreat. Or how come if that maze heating heat is not delayed by her heart frozen cold, but that I burn much more in boiling sweat? And feel my flames augmented manifold. What more miraculous thing may be told that fire, which all things melt, should harden ice, and ice which is congealed with senseless cold should kindle fire by wonderful device. Such is the power of love in gentle mind that it can alter all the course of kind. Okay, so that's an example of a Spencerian sonnet written by Edmund Spencer. That's Sonnet 30, Fire and Ice. Okay, so let's take a look with the rhyme scheme. Because again, the only difference between a Shakespearean sonnet and a Spencerian sonnet only lies on the rhyme scheme. Okay, so by analyzing the rhyme scheme, once again... We are going to look at the end rhyme or the sound in every end of the line. Okay, the first line, okay, the last word is fire. The sound, er, okay, so that's letter A. Of course, we always start with letter A. Then the next word, in the next line, the next word is great. It's different, so we label it with letter B. Desire rhymes with fire, so it's letter A again. And treat uh, rhymes with great, so that's letter B. So in the first line, we already achieved the rhyme scheme A, B, A, B. Now, here comes the second stanza. Because in the second stanza, 
it should uh, form now the distinction of a Spears is Spencerian sonnet. Okay. The last word in the first line of the second stanza is heat. Okay. Remember, heat rhymes with great and entreat. So that's letter B. Okay. Then cold. Cold is a new sound, so we label it with, label it with letter C. Then sweat. Sweat rhymes with heat, entreat, and great. So it's letter B again. And manifold. Manifold rhymes with cold. So it's letter C. So the second stanza has a rhyme scheme BC, BC. Now let's continue on the third stanza. First line, told. Told rhymes with manifold and cold, so we label it with letter C. Ice. Ice does not rhyme with any line, so it's a new word, it's a new sound, so it's letter D. Cold. Cold rhymes with told manifold, so it's letter C. Device. Rhymes with ice. So that's letter D. So in the third stanza, the rhyme scheme is CD, CD. Now let's take a look into the couplet, the, the last remaining lines. Mind, okay, that's another sound, so we label it with letter E. And the next one is kind, which rhymes with mind, so that's again letter E. So our rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, and E, E. Basically, the same rhyme scheme that I told you in the definition of a Spencerian sonnet. Once again, remember, that's the only difference between the Spencerian sonnet and the Shakespearean sonnet. Their rhyme scheme. Okay. Now we're done with the lyric poetry, okay? Now let's go to the next form of poetry. The next form of poetry is called narrative poetry. Now in narrative poetry, it focuses on telling a story. It is a poetry that tells a story and its structure is, resembles the plot line of a story. Example, it has an introduction, it has conflict, it has characters, it has rising action, it has climax, and of course, it has a denoma. The most common types of narrative poetry are ballad and epic. Okay, so the difference between a lyric poetry and a narrative poetry is that the lyric poetry focuses on the emotions and thoughts. Okay? It is more emotional, intense emotion, while narrative poetry focuses on telling a story. And again, it has the same plot structure of a story. So let's go into the two most common example of a narrative poetry, which is number one, a ballad. Okay, I know you are familiar with ballads because ballads are meant to be sung. And usually it's a love song. Okay, there are popular Filipino balladeer, probably you know them, not? Christian Bautista, and Jed Medela, okay, there are some Filipino balladeer that probably you know, probably, I don't know if you really know, because I know them, I don't know if you know them, but probably you know them. <laughs> Anyways, let's not try to confuse each other. Let's go back to ballad. So, ballad is a narrative poem. When we say narrative poem, it narrates a story, but usually it has a musical rhythm and can be sung. 
A ballad is usually organized into quatrains or cinquains. So it could be quatrains or it could be cinquains. Again, quatrains are stanzas composed of four lines, while cinquains are stanzas composed of five lines. It has a simple rhythm structure and it tells the tale of ordinary people. Okay, so remember that because that's the key word in defining ballad. It tells the tale or stories of ordinary people. Okay, an example of ballad is a poem written by one of my favorite English author, um, Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, the title of the, the poem is Annabel Lee. It's only an excerpt, meaning it's only part of the original poem. The, uh, the poem goes like this. I'm going to read again. Okay, I hate this lecture because I keep on reading poems. <laughs> but anyways, um, poems are meant to be enjoyed in the auditory sense. So I'd like you to enjoy it in auditory sense by hearing the uh, poem being read. It was many and many years ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and love by me. Okay, so that's an example of a story of Annabel Lee. So if you're going to read the whole poem, it basically tells the story of a maiden who lived by the sea. So the title of the story, the, star, the poem is Annabel Lee. Okay. So if you want to read the entire poem, you just search in Google and type Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> anyway, so that's an example of a ballad. It recounts a story of an ordinary person. Okay, ordinary. When we say ordinary, nothing special just an ordinary person okay the next form of poetry is epic okay just like the ballad it also narr narrates a story however the main difference between a ballad and an epic is that the ballad tells tells the tale or stories of ordinary people while Epic is written in elevated style, recounting the deeds oh, or stories of legendary or historical heroes. These are not normal people. Ballad recounts the story of ordinary people, while Epic recounts stories of legendary. It's like Mobile Legend. Legendary. And historical hero so example of an epic includes the popular greek mythology iliad by homer and beowulf of course beowulf is the longest is it the longest and uh, no not the longest but the oldest epic in the world i'm sorry because the longest is Mah mahabharata and ramayana Okay, that's the longest. But the oldest is Beowulf, an English epic. Then the third example is very popular, Divine Comedy, remember, Inferno by Dante Alighieri. And Metamorphosis by Ovid. And actually many, many more. Okay? Um, remember, epic is considered an epic if they recount a story of, again, legendary heroes or historical hero. In Philippines, we have our very own epic. Okay, who can guess? Oh, I can hear it from the computer. <laughs> I have this extra sensory perception now that I can hear your voice from my computer to your computer using the internet sound waves. <laughs> That's just a joke. Anyway, yes, you are right. That's Biag Nilamang, an Ilocano epic that recounts the story of an immortal, extraordinary hero. Okay, remember Lamang when when he was born, he can already 
talk and this is the one who told his mother to name him Lamang. But anyways, that's a story for another lesson to tell. So let's continue on the epic. Again, epic is a narrative poetry that recounts the story of legendary and historical heroes. Okay. The third form of poetry is descriptive poetry. Okay. So, unlike narrative, it does not focus on telling a story, but it focuses on description. Usually, it uses vivid imagery in order to evoke the different senses of human being. Remember the different senses? The visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, and the tactile. Okay, so those are the different senses, okay, the different imagery that is being evoked in poetry. So going back, a descriptive poem is a poem that describes the world that surrounds the speaker. It uses elaborate imagery and adjectives, while emotional, it is more outward focused than a lyric poetry which uh, lyric poetry is more of a personal because you deal with thoughts and emotion while the descriptive poetry is more focused on the outwards, the description of the surrounding of the speaker. Now, I'll give you a very concrete example of a descriptive poetry. I learned this when I was in grade one, and I'm going to share this to you. It's entitled, All Things Bright and Beautiful by Cecil Francis Alexander. Okay. It, uh, the poem goes like this. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens... Each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors, he made their tiny wings. The purple hidden mountain, the river running by, the sunset and the morning, the brightens of the sky. The cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruit in the garden, he made them every one. He gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell how great is God Almighty who has made all things well. Okay, so that is the example that I prepared. I was very excited to read that to you because I learned that poem when I was in grade one. Again, the title of the poem is All Things Bright and Beautiful and it is written by Cecil Francis Alexander. So uh, take note on how the the, the poem uses different words that evokes different vivid images. Okay, when you read the poem, as it is as if you are painting a picture in your memory or in your mind. It it creates a mental a mental image. I'm sorry, it's very hard. So that's a mental image. Okay, so upon reading the poem. Okay, so that's an example of a descriptive poetry. Now, those are the three basic forms of poetry. Again, let me recap. The first one is a lyric poetry. A lyric poetry is more personal and it has extreme feelings or emotion. The second one is a narrative poetry which narrates a story. Okay? And the third one is a descriptive poetry which describes the surroundings, okay? describes the outside world or the, world's, the world around you. Now, there are other forms of poetry that we are going to discuss. This, this is very important because you might encounter them already. And you have already learned this in your junior high school. The first one is a haiku. Okay, I know you have heard this already, and from the word itself, we can say that it's Japanese. Yes, it is Japanese. It has a rhymed verse having three syllables or a tercet. Okay, remember, um, 
uh, re re remember a third set that is a stanza composed of three lines. Okay, again, unrhymed verse. So no need to worry about rhyming because it is an unrhymed verse forming three lines or a third set. And usually, okay, this is the difficult thing about writing a haiku because you have to be very particular into the syllables, the number of syllables per line, okay? Remember, it's a third set, three lines. The first line should be composed of five syllables only. The second line should be seven syllables. And the third line is five syllables. So you have to count each line about on the number of syllables because you might qualify for the three lines, but you may be disqualified for the number of syllables for your poem to be considered a haiku, okay? It is usually considered a lyric poem because haikus are intensely emotional, okay? I'll give an example of a haiku. <laughs> I'm not fun of a, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of haiku, but anyways, um, we're going to discuss haiku. Is a... Uh, a poem written by Matsu Bashu. Uh, the title is By the Old Pond. An old silent pond, a frog jumps into the pond. Splash, silence again. Ooh. So let's take a look into the structure of this poem if it, is con if it can be or if it can qualify as a haiku. First, let's count the number of lines. One, two, three. So there are three lines, meaning it's a third set, and a third set qualifies for a haiku. Now let's go into the number of syllables per line, if it qualifies to be called a haiku. First line, let's syllabicate. And, that's one syllable, old, then silent. That word is composed of two syllables, silent. So two syllables, then pond, that's another syllable. So let's count the number of syllables in the first line. One, two, let me let me use the arrow. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that's and, that's one, two, three, four, five. Five syllables in the first line. Let's take a look at the second syllables. I don't know, the second line, if it has the number of syllables that we are looking into. Okay, a frog jumps into the pond. So, a frog jumps into, this has two syllables, into the pond. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, there are seven syllables in the second line. Now, let's have, or let's take a look with third line. Splash. Silence again. Now, splash is considered as one syllable because when you read splash, you're not going to say is splash, but you're going to say splash. It's a glide. Remember? Glide. Splash. So that's one breath, one syllable only. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five. Five syllables. First line, five. Second line, seven. Third line, five syllables. So it has five, seven, five syllables in a third set. Therefore, we can conclude that it is a genuine, legitimate haiku. <laughs> okay, so again, you can probably find haikus on the internet or in some book. And all you need to do is to qualify them if they are really haiku by counting the number of lines in the stanza and counting the number of syllables in every line. If they possesses the five seven five syllable pattern, okay. Now the next form of poetry is limerick. Oh, limerick! It has a very structured poem, usually humorous, and composed of five lines or a cinquain. Do not forget that if a stanza is composed of five lines, it is called a cinquain. The rhyme scheme is A A B B A, and the beat must be anapestic. Okay, you remember my discussion in the part one about the 
metrical pattern or the rhythmic pattern. So it's anapestic. Anapestic is composed of two unstressed syllables followed by one stressed syllable. Weak, weak, strong. With three feet in line, that's one, two, and five, and two feet in lines, three and four. So it is usually a narrative poem. So unlike the haiku, which is usually a lyric poem, a limerick is usually a narrative, and it is sought upon, you know, based on a short and often a rival anecdote. Okay, it usually tells a short story, an anecdote. So that's limerick. Okay, so again, the only the only difference between oh no, the difference between a limerick and a ballad is first, a ballad is um, emotional, so it's lyric, while limerick is more of a narrative. It recounts an anecdote, and the ballad is con uh, no no the I'm sorry, I, I think I'm confused here. I'm, I'm talking about haiku, not a ballad. <laughs> sorry. So, the haiku, okay, the haiku is composed of three lines only, while limerick is composed of a sinquine. Okay, so haiku is a third set, and limerick is a sinquine. Okay, haiku is emotional, it's a lyric poetry, limerick is more of a narrative poetry recounting an anecdote and it follows an anapestic rhythm which is weak weak strong or the two uns unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable so that's anapestic okay so there you go let's take a look into an example of a limerick i prepared here a poem written by dixon leonard murray a wonderful bird's a wonderful bird is the pelican. His bill can hold more than his bellican. He can take in his beak food enough for a week, but I'm damned if I see how the helican. So it's, and if you know if you notice there are words that is being played, what do you call that? It is called what literary device again? Now I'm exercising my exercising my extra sensory perception using using virtual or digital powers. Now going back, there are word plays, okay, and that literary devices are usually called anagram. Oh, anagram, the word play. Okay, let's take a look into the rhyme scheme. Pelican A, Balkan A, B B, Week B. Okay, Helican A. Okay. Okay. So, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did not remember you. I'm just reading it on my own. So, I'll, let me go back so that you can follow why I label them, label them with A and B. So, the first sound, Pelican, of course, we start with the letter A. So, that sound is labeled as letter A. The next word, Belican. And a Belican sounds with a Pelican. So that's another letter A. The next line ends with beak, and it's a different sound, a new sound. So we label it with letter B. The next sound is weak, which rhymes with beak. That's why it's again labeled as letter B. And the last line ends with helican, which rhymes with belican and pelican. So that's another letter A. Okay, that's why the rhyme scheme of this poem is A-A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. So that's the rhyme scheme for the poem, a poem by Dixon Lanier Murray. Okay. Now, I hope that you have followed me through my discussion and you enjoyed uh, learning a poetry in this um, specific lesson. Now, I want you to look into your activity sheets, in your learning activity sheets, and answer the activities that I have prepared for you there. But for now, I prepared something as a self-assessment if you really read or if you really followed me in my lecture. 
Okay? I want you to read again the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Okay, remember, we already had an activity in the part one using the poem Invictus. And in that activity, you analyze the poem by analyzing the matter and the rhythmic pattern of the poem. This time, it's going to be different. All you need to do is that you're going to analyze again the poetry as to what kind of poetry it is according to its form. Is it a lyric poetry? Is it a narrative poetry? Or is it a descriptive poetry? Now, if you ask me if these three kinds of poetry can be merged together, yes, you are correct. There are poems that can be emotional at the same time, descriptive, and at the same time, it tells a story. So it depends, as long as you can, explain to me your answer, why you chose or... You know, why you tell, why you can tell that it is a lyric, a narrative, or a descriptive poetry. Again, there are poetries that has three categories. So all the categories are present in one poetry. Now, I only want you to answer the question, what kind of poetry is it? And then explain your answer. Okay? So as long as you can explain your answer, I'm good with it. Write your answer in the comment section below and that will serve as your attendance for today's lecture. And after that, you are free to answer the questions that I prepared or the activities I prepared in your learning or the learner's activity sheets. Have a great day! And once again, if you have further questions, feel free to comment in the comment section below or directly give me a message or text me. Call me or just approach me if you dare. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Have a great day.